So Hardin is looking at these different mechanisms for controlling self-interests so that the remorseless working of things doesn't kick in. And uh, again, his major preoccupation was population growth uh, in, in the late 60s. But as you can see, it, it really applies to lots of other resources we have in common. He writes, the great challenge, the great challenge facing us now is to invent the corrective feedbacks that are needed to keep custodians honest, those who are in charge of caring for the resource. Feedbacks that will keep the, those people honest. We must find ways to legitimate the needed authority of both the custodians and the feedback mechanisms. Because, well, you think of the pasture land, right? If, if um, you have somebody who's appointed to say, well, you have two cows, you have three cows, you have one cow, how do we know that person allocating the resource is um, not just being pursuing her own self-interest? What if she's taking bribes from farmer number one, right, or... or, or uh, 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 the, the owner number three? Or how do we know that she understands the resource? How do we know that the authority of, that regulates our use is legitimate? That, that's really the issue, isn't it? Isn't it? How do we know the authority that regulates our use is legitimate? That's why there's so much noise around this climate change stuff. You have you know, the vast majority of scientists saying it's real, the temperatures are going up, and there are going to be very, very serious consequences for many people across the planet. But people are challenging that because they say, how do I know your scientific authority isn't somehow a cover for your political agenda? How do I know that your scientific authority, which is going to, if we follow your recommendations, is going to result in significant changes to how I make money, how I live my life, how my country works. How do I know that authority is real? is legitimate. Um, you are not elected as a scientist. You're not, you know, g you know, have God-given powers. How do I know? And so I, what I do if to protect my self-interest, let's say, I find some other scientist who disagrees with you. I find some other authority that I say is more legitimate. To go back to the pasture, you know, the person says, well, you, Roth, can only have two cows on this land because otherwise, if everybody has more than two cows... Um, you were going to deplete the pasture. So I, I go off and find some other, <laughs> some, you know, a cousin of mine who, who has another pasture land, and I say, Can't you, isn't it true that I should have, be able to have four cows? And he says, oh, yes, because your cows are different. So you can have four cows. Then I, I bring in this authority to try to get out of the remorseless working of things, to get out of regulation. And Hardin says that this mechanism of trying to deny the truth of the limits of our sharing, that mechanism creates this tragedy again and again and again. So what we need, Hardin writes, and this is in 1968, right? Very prescient. The only kind of coercion, he writes, I recommend is mutual coercion. Mutually agreed upon by the majority of the people affected. It's really interesting because we'll, we'll see as we go on in the course that this is exactly what social psychologists and economists and, and historians and anthropologists uh, now see as, as, as the, uh, 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 the way to go, that people will actually obey uh, uh, authority when they feel it's been mutually agreed upon, when they feel that they've given the law to themselves, so to speak, that they've given the regulation to themselves. I'll give you another quote from Hardin. To say that we mutually agree to coercion is not to say that we are required to enjoy it or even to pretend we enjoy it. Who enjoys taxes, he writes? We all grumble about them, but we accept compulsory taxes because we recognize that voluntary taxes would favor the conscience less. That is, if we just said, okay, pay, everybody should do a tax without um, enforcement, we know that lots of people just wouldn't pay their taxes because they don't have a strong conscience. An appeal to conscience, Hardin says, is not enough. We need teeth in the appeal. We need, we need authority. But it has to be authority that we all recognize is necessary. Nobody likes the tax collectors. But we, what we know that because they're tax collectors, we pay 
more happily because we feel we're part of a community. Everyone uh, is doing uh, their part. We, we institute and grumblingly, he says, support taxes and other coercive devices to escape the horror of the commons, to escape the horror of depleting a resource we know we need to live. But in order to escape that horror, we need mutual agreement. We need, Hardin says, mutual agreement that the coercion is necessary. He, he, he has this line that we're not more free because we have laws against bank robbery, right? I can't go out and rob a bank now because there's a law against bank robbery. But we accept the law, the coercion, because over time, we all benefit from that coercive force against bank robbery. We accept the limitation of our freedom because we recognize the necessity of a law against a robbery. And here, Hardin quotes a philosopher um, I, I'm fond of teaching in my other classes. He quotes Hegel as freedom is the recognition of necessity. This is near the end of the article. But what does freedom mean, Hardin writes? When men mutually agreed to pass laws against robbing, mankind, mankind became more free in the end, not less so. Individuals locked into the logic of the commons are free only to bring on universal ruin. They're only free to bring on universal ruin. Once they see the necessity of mutual coercion, they become free to pursue other goals. In other words, once you realize that mutually agreed upon regulation, management, uh, is the way to go, uh, then you are free to pursue other goals because you know the resource on which you depend is protected by the limitation you have taken on yourself, the limitation on your freedom you have taken on yourself. That's why he says freedom is the recognition of necessity. Freedom is the recognition of necessity, quoting Hegel. So that notion that we are willing to and able to accept regulation when we uh, think we have agreed upon it, when we, when, we, when we say that we are bringing it to ourselves, that is a lo- there's a long tradition about that in political philosophy. Uh, even uh, be, well, well before Hegel, we, we can think back to the French philosopher just before the French Revolution, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who said that freedom is the obedience to a law that you give yourself. Isn't that? Freedom is obedience to a law that you give yourself. Kant, um, uh, also in the German Enlightenment tradition, Kant also um, wrote about freedom as the conforming your will to a universal law. And when, you conf- when your will is conformed to a law, then you know you are free as well as being rational. What Hardin, <clears throat> excuse me, what Hardin is ad- adding to this mix in political philosophy is the notion that uh, when you take on coercive forces against your own self-interest, you escape this tragedy uh, of the commons. Now, uh, in the decades since Hardin's uh, important article uh, appeared, uh, many economists and other commentators have um, uh, worked on this issue of the tragedy of the commons. Some of them have found examples of groups that have managed quite well to uh, regulate themselves uh, and preserve their commons. Um, One of the most important is Eleanor Ostrom. Eleanor Ostrom, and we're going to give you a video clip uh, of uh, of a short lecture she gave uh, on Hardin and on this issue, where she talks about uh, farmers who are able to have some of their land in private and some of their land in common, but they watch each other in such a way as that no one takes more than their share. Right? No one takes more than their share. Um, and um, um, cooperation, cooperation, um, taking on uh, self-limitation through cooperation uh, has become a, a subject of enormous interest to people commenting on economics, on technology, um, uh, and um, on, on climate change. Uh, I'm going to just mention... One of the other readings we've assigned for this week, Professor uh, Jochai Benkler, who teaches law at at Harvard University now, um, has a a recent book 
uh, that I've, uh, I've asked you to look at um, called Leviathan and the Penguin. And, and Benkler's point is that many of us have assumed that uh, everything is guided by self-interest. Everything, everybody is guided by um, narrow instrumentalism uh, and always looking out for them, for them just for themselves. And, and what Bankless says we've discovered, especially through um, um, the, the modes of cooperation we see uh, if, if online, in social media and other places online, we see that cooperation also speaks to a very powerful um, a natural tendency of human beings, uh, a social tendency and a natural tendency of human beings. And so what Benkler writes about is how the tragedy of the commons uh, can be avoided by tapping into our natural interests um, in socializing, cooperating, and finding solutions together. Hi, we're here today with uh, two of my colleagues at, at Wesleyan University to talk about the idea of the commons. And um, I, I think we'd begin by just asking you to introduce yourselves. Yes, I am Friedrich apfel -Marglin. I am visiting this year at the College of the Environment, part of the think tank. I'm an anthropologist. I retired myself early from Smith so that I could have my dream life after my last child graduated from college, and I founded a nonprofit organization in the Peruvian high Amazon, and I work on reforestation and climate change. And I'm Barry Chernoff. I'm the director of the College of the Environment, and I'm a professor of biology and earth and environmental sciences. Thank you very much for, for joining me today, and, and we're going to start off with this idea of the commons, which uh, in the class comes out of the Social Good Summit. I, I, I thought we would start this class immodestly titled How to Change the World by looking at this notion of a social good and what is a social good as opposed to a private good. And I've talked with a political philosopher about this. And uh, in the course of um, preparing the syllabus, I saw that at the College of the Environment at Wesleyan this year, the think tank is engaged in, in uh, working through this idea of the commons. And, and maybe we could start by hearing a little bit from uh, Professor Chernoff about well, uh, how how you how you got to this idea of the commons as a as a subject for for the College of the Environment? The commons is uh, one of the crucial issues that I think we're facing today, and whether you're in the United States or in other countries, and it deals with the the role of the resources that we as humans have, sometimes share or sometimes not share, and so because of the critical nature of what are happening to these common resources worldwide and because of increasing um, globalization and looking now at resources in dimensions that we never conceived of before, that is mm -hmm. planet-wise, right. um, that we thought it was really critical to bring um, that in at, at a time where people are starting to focus again on the commons and how are we going to deal with this in the modern context. And Frederic, um, how did your work uh, in anthropology and now this work on reforestation, how, does, how is that connected to the, the notion of the commons? Well, the, the forest uh, in the high Amazon has been a commons for the indigenous people. Yes. They call it their house, their home, their mm -hmm. market, their sacred space. And uh, of course, what is happening today is that the government, the Peruvian government, is giving in concession uh, to uh, multinationals uh, these forest commons, most egregiously to oil companies because the, dev the ecological devastation is very bad, but for timbering, for mining, and the mining is very, very bad as mm. well. And then they also try to create reserve, but they are giving in concession the reserves. Huh. So they're taking thing, land that was in the public sphere exactly. and privatizing and pri it. And giving it, you know, for temporary 90, I don't know how many years lease to these multinationals. And it got so bad in Peru uh, because 75% of the country was given in concession to multinationals or private, big private companies. And most of these lands were ancestral indigenous lands. And it came to a head 
in uh, June of 2009, where the Amazonian um, indigenous people got together and stopped the main road right. mm -hmm. that carries all the extractive things from uh -huh. the Amazon, and that put pressure. And the government eventually decided to send uh, machine guns in helicopters, and uh, it was a massacre. Now, officially, only 11 uh, indigenous people died, but it's been monitored by many, many uh, organizations, and there were hundreds of them, and they would throw them in the river and so wow. forth. So it's, it's really come to a tremendous head, that issue. And do you see that um, this assault on the commons in, in, in this particular place uh, is indicative of pressure on the idea of the a common uh, ancestral or uh, public holdings elsewhere? Or is this, is this a, 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 an aberration, or is this some part of a trend? No, I think that's, that's happening all over the global south. Yes. I mean, I've worked in India for many years. It's happened in India, it happens in, in Latin America, it's happening everywhere. So, um, if, if one's in the government, you know, or one is thinking, uh, let's, let's, I'm trying to get to the, the rationality of, not for massacres, for which there is no rationality, it's, uh, but the rationality of trying to um, uh, use the commons uh, or use these lands for uh, rational purposes. I'm trying. To, I'm, I guess I'm trying to get to what's the other. Is there another side? Is there a way of saying, well, this is this is why we have to use these lands differently? Or, well, I, I, your question puts me in mind of James Scott's book, uh, State Simplifications, yes. uh, and the beginning of forestry um, in Europe. Yes. And, uh, that started, I think, I mean, scientific forestry started in the 18th century, but the, the government, you know, with the nation state yes. in the 17th century, the birth of the nation state, the focus was very centralized, administrative, and you needed to, um, have knowledge, the, the central state, mm -hmm. the government, you need to have total knowledge of land distribution, commons, everything, and to calculate what they could get in revenue. I see. And uh, started happening in France, it's in Germany, uh, scientific forestry was born in Germany, uh, and then it immediately went to England yes. uh, with the British, and uh, they uh, denuded uh, forests of India, yes. uh, of course, mostly for building railroad, railroad ties. Yes. Uh, but the idea it was then and is still today, basically revenue yeah. for the central government. Right. So, so what's interesting is for me, as is, is you describe that, is this kind of the, the logic of state development, right? Is to, yes. is to find revenue sources, uh, uh, the exploitation of wealth, and bring them into the central government. I guess what's interesting in the Peruvian example you give is that it's also being privatized. It's not just revenue for the government, it's revenue for these co corporations. Yes, but of course, they have to they get pay. Yes. They get their cut. Yes. And so they can get something. And uh, uh, it's happening everywhere. It seems that the logic of the market, the logic of globalization uh, is forcing, for example, uh, Korea in, mm -hmm. in Ecuador has tried. Uh, he said, I am going to put it out to the international community to save this preserve that has the highest biodiversity in the world. Yes. And, but I need revenue. So if the international community can pay me uh -huh. to preserve this, right. uh, then we will not develop it for oil. Well, nobody, uh -huh. they, he got a piddle, so nice. he has, he's going to develop it. It's so, not working. So, so do you think, uh, Barry, that that the that this logic of I guess it's a logic of domination and exploitation is inexorable? I mean, it's just that this is just it's been happening for a couple hundred years, and, and it's can, can can it are there 
Are there ways it can be changed or is changing? Well, l- let me first say that it, it's been going on for thousands of years. So, for example... Um, that doesn't make me feel better. No, no <laughs> it's not supposed to. But, but it, it, does, it does look at an issue, as pointed out by um, Clive Ponting and others, um, the whole area of North Africa all the way through the Anatolian Plateau into um, Greece and Turkey through... Um, was uh, 1,500, 2,000 years ago was mature, dense forest right. that was cut down by the people living there. Now, whether that was done for nation states or not, but clearly they used the wood for enterprise. Right. So, and, and there are lots of examples that we can talk about how common resources have been um, pillaged or used um, in excess for um, commercial commercial use. And this this goes back thousands of years um, in humanity. And right now, I think there's a lot of pressure for um, nations that do not have lots of um, commercial resources on an international basis to use these products for um, as sources of international currency. Mm. An excellent example is um, in addition to the wood example, because that's happening all through South America where um, front companies are actually um, exporting the wood primarily to Asia. Mm -hmm. Um, In Bolivia, for example, it is illegal for more than 5% of the country to be to be um, lumbered by non, um, non-Bolivian non companies. Mm-hmm. But in fact, there are Bolivian front companies that are owned by Malaysians and others, right. th- so the money's going out. But in, um, in Africa, for example, um, in Uganda and um, Tanzania, this exact change has happened with the artisanal fisheries in Lake Victoria, where... Um, governmental pressure as well as bank and investment pressure turned what was an artisanal, almost sustainable fishery into a commercialized fishery where the um, fishers are now employees rather than owning the resource. And it turns out for both Tanzania and Uganda that um, fish exportation to Europe primarily is the number one source of foreign currency, exceeding coffee and tourism. So, so the pressure is really, really high. 